Good evening, brethren. Brother Gibbons' text tonight is, he has two texts. One of them is Joshua chapter 7, verses 3 and 4. And they returned to Joshua and said unto him, Let not all, of, all the people go up, but let about two or three thousand men go up and smite Ai, and make not all the people labor, labor thither, for they are but few. So went, so went they up thither unto the people, about three thousand men, and they fled before the men of Ai. The other is Judges chapter 16, verses 20 and 21. And she said, Phil The Philistines be upon thee, Samson. And he woke out of his sleep and said, I will go out as other times before, and shake myself. And he wist not that God was departed from him. But the Philistines took him, and put out his eyes, and brought him down to Kaza, and bought him, bound him with feathers of brass, and he did grind in the prison house. Now, Brother Givens' topic tonight is the difference between real assurance and spurious assurance. Now, spurious, I had to look it up, and through all the long words and drawn out definitions, it basically boiled down to one word and its synonyms. It's a fake, false, a counterfeit, a mimic of the real thing. Now, I could have assurance that a, leg, a chair with three legs could hold me up, but I'd soon find out the hard way, might I add, that it won't hold me up. It'll topple over as soon as my weight hits it. Laodicea, of, Laodicea is a prime example of having spurious assurance. Spurious assurance has to do with being deceived. I'd like to read a text from Re Revelation chapter 3, verses 14 through 17. And unto the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write, These things sayest the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. I know thy works, that thou art neither hot nor cold, I would that thou wert cold or hot. So then, because thou art lukewarm, and neither hot nor cold, I will spew thee out of my mouth. Because thou sayest, I am rich, and increased with goods, and have need of nothing. And knoweth not that thou art wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. See, these people, in La they ought to see had spurious assurance. They thought they had need of nothing. It was a misassessment of what they could and couldn't do, or what they did and didn't have. And also, in Joshua 9, and the, elder of, the elders of Israel, they had spurious assurance. I'm going to read this in, in this, this in increments. Joshua chapter 9, verses 3 through 8. And when the inhabitants of Gibeon heard what Joshua had done unto Jericho and unto Ai, they did work wily, and went as made as, and made as if they had been ambassadors, and took old sacks upon their asses, and wine bottles old and rent and bound up and old shoes and clouded upon their feet, and old garments upon them. And all the bread of their provision was dry and moldy. And they went to Joshua unto the camp at Gilgal, and said unto him and the men of Israel, We be come from a far country. Now therefore make ye a league with us. And the men of Israel said unto the Hivites, Peradventure ye dwell among us. How shall we make a league with you? And they said unto Joshua, We are thy servants. And Joshua said unto them, Who are ye? And from whence come ye? Now, part of the Gibe this was part of the Gibeonites' plan for the Israelites to make a league with them was to flatter them. We find this in verses 9 through 11. And they said unto him, From a very far country thy servants are come because of the name of the Lord thy God. For we have heard the fame of him and all that he did in Egypt and all that he did to the two kings of the Amorites that were beyond Jordan and to Sihon the king of Heshbon and to Og the king of Bashan which was at Ashtaroth. Wherefore, our elders and the inhabitants of our country spake unto us, saying, Take victuals with you for the journey, and go meet them, and say unto them, We are your servants. Therefore, now we make a league with us. Now, it wasn't really flattering the Israelites. It was flattering God, in whom the Israelites trusted. Now we come to the 14th verse. And we see that not only did the elders of Israel have spurious assurance, but they didn't take counsel from the mouth of God. Verse 14, And the men took not... And the men took of their victuals and asked not counsel at the mouth of the Lord. And Joshua made peace with them and made a league with them and let them live. And the princes of the congregation swear unto them. Now they did soon realize their error. And here's what they did about it. Verses 20, 20 and 21. This will be due to them. We will even let them live, lest wrath be upon us because of the oath which he swore unto them. And the princes said unto them, Let them live. But let them be hewers of wood and drawers of water unto all the congregation, 
as the princess has promised them. So being deceived, having spurious assurance, always has its consequences. It never helps you. It hinders you all the time. Now, examples of real assurance, I had two of them. Job was one of them. Job 121, the second part. The Lord gave and the Lord hath taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Now he was convinced that all things work together for the good of them that loved God to them who were called according to his purpose. Now the real, the ultimate example of assurance is of course Jesus. He is the perfect example of every virtue that there is to be had in scripture and this is no exception. Matthew 26, 39. And he went a little further and fell on his face and prayed saying, Oh my father, if it be possible... Let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as thou wilt. So he was willing to suffer for God's name to be glorified. And he suffered because he had assurance correctly that it would be. So brethren, let us know that we do have real assurance. And if we're, if we're deceived, then we haven't believed the truth. So my exhortation to you is be not deceived and believe the truth.